1835, revolution is in the air. Cohila y Tejas, the sparsely populated state on the fringes of the Mexican Republic, teeters on the brink of armed rebellion. Across the state, Anglo-American settlers are standing in open defiance of the centralist government under Antonio Lopez of Santa Ana in Mexico City. This defiance will set off a year-long war in Texas that would create legendary Western personas, be the scene of savage battles on the American frontier that would take on near-mythical proportions, and transform not only the future of the North American continent, but the world we know today. This is the Texas Revolution. The land that will encompass Texas on the northern fringes of New Spain holds little more than endless prairies and forests. It contains only a few isolated pockets of civilization along the Gulf Coast and the Rio Grande. Initial attempts by the Spanish government to populate the desolate region are unsuccessful as the northern frontier is extremely poor compared to the more prosperous regions in the heart of New Spain. By 1821, Texas has a population of around 3,500, concentrated in the settlements of San Antonio de Bejar and La Baya. These settlements are far too small to deal with the constant raids conducted by the Comanches and American filibusters who prey upon the northern frontier. In hopes of creating a buffer between the more populated lands to the south and the constant raids, the Spanish government in Mexico City offers free land to anybody willing to migrate to Texas to develop and defend the frontier. One of the first people to take on this offer to colonize Texas is a Missourian named Moses Austin. Austin was a St. Louis bank owner whose wealth disappeared during the Panic of 1819, forcing him to sell off his property to cover his expenses, and fled to Texas in the hopes of starting a new business venture in the Spanish frontier. Realizing that Texas is underpopulated, Austin convinces the Spanish governor of the region, Antonio Maria Martinez, to let him colonize the territory with American settlers. Therefore, Moses Austin will be granted the first impresario contract to settle the northern frontier. However, Moses Austin will never settle his colony in Texas, as when he returns to Missouri to recruit settlers, he becomes ill with pneumonia and dies in June of 1821. Yet, this is not in Austin's goal of colonizing Texas, as his son Stephen, who is in Louisiana at the time obtaining financial backing, decides to carry on his late father's enterprise. Stephen travels to San Antonio in August to be authorized to carry on his father's colonization efforts on the Texas coast. After negotiating with Governor Martinez, Austin is authorized to settle 300 families on the land between the San Antonio and Brazos rivers. Once all the arrangements are in place, Austin travels to New Orleans to recruit settlers for his colony. With the effects of the recent Panic of 1819 still lingering, Many people take advantage of the highly generous terms Austin offers in his new colony. However, just as Austin is settling people in Texas, troublesome news arrives from Mexico City. New Spain is on the brink of collapse as revolutionaries take over large chunks of territory from the Spanish government. In September of 1821, after 11 years of vicious fighting, revolutionaries declare victory in Mexico City and established a Mexican empire with Augustine de Urtibide as its first emperor. The new government in Mexico City refuses to approve the Spanish grant offered to Austin, forcing him to travel to Mexico City to implore Congress to change their minds. Eventually, after two years of petitioning, Austin is finally approved to settle his colony by the provisional government in 1823. For the next two years, Austin will settle 300 families in his colony. His colony will thrive under his leadership as he requires the heads of the households to work a trade and assist in the defense of the colony. To deal with the mobile natives, Austin forms ranging companies of horsemen to protect the settlers from Indian attacks and police the settlements. These volunteers will be the precursors of the dreaded Texas Rangers, known for their skills in shooting and horseback riding. While Austin is building up his colony, more men are authorized in Pizarro contracts by the Mexican government to settle in Texas as well. From 1824 to 1830, over 30 men are granted contracts, with some notables being David G. Burnett, Green DeWitt, Hayden H. Edwards, and Lorenzo de Zavala. 
However, problems start to rise as Anglo-Americans start arriving in the state in greater numbers. Unlike the original settlers of Austin's colony, who accepted the terms of their settlement, such as working a trade, learning Spanish, converting to Catholicism, and the ban on slavery, the more recent colonists disregarded the conditions of their settlement, content to keep their life as it had been back in the United States. This refusal by the newcomers arriving in Texas alarms many about what's to come when the Anglos become the majority of the state. Though the relations between the Anglo newcomers and the native Tejanos are cordial for the first few years of the 1820s, tensions start to rise as a few empresarios try to confiscate Tejano land. In 1825, Mexican authorities are unsettled by the actions of Hayden Edwards in his colony around the settlement of Nacogdoches. Edwards believes that he was authorized to determine the validity of pre-existing land deeds. As Edwards goes around his colony, he finds that most of the Spanish-speaking landowners and American filibusters have no documents to verify their land claims, and starts removing them from their lands. Edwards, who is a wealthy planter from Kentucky, holds contempt for those who are poor and not American. He desires to create a rich colony in East Texas. Soon, Governor Jose Antonio Salcedo of the newly created state of Cohila y Tejas catches wind of Edwards' scheme to rid the poor from his colony and revokes his grant. This enrages Edwards as he has invested over $50,000 into his colony and is not willing to let it go. On December 16, 1826, hoping to keep control, Hayden allies with the local Cherokee tribe and invades his former capital Nacogdoches with a force of 30 loyalist settlers. The armed group of men marches into the town and seizes the largest building in the area, a two-story stone building. Five days later on December 21st, the Loyalists raise a white and red banner declaring Edwards calling an independent republic, the Republic of Fredonia. Upon their declaration, Edwards sends out a call for military aid from both the United States and other Anglo-American colonies in Texas, but neither assists him. Upon hearing of the revolts, Mexican authorities swiftly act against the rebellion. On January 1, 1827, a Mexican force of 110 infantry, augmented by 250 Texian militia from Austin's colony, march against the rebels in East Texas. To his surprise, Edward learns that not a single Cherokee will be coming to his aid to repel the advancing Mexican army. Instead of facing the force marching against them, Edwards and his men flee across the Sabine River into Louisiana, ending the Fredonia Rebellion. Though small in scale, the Fredonia Rebellion seriously damages the faulty relationship between the Mexican authorities and the American colonists in Texas, even for those who sided with the state against the rebellious settlers in Nacogdoches. To curtail future immigration, authorities in the state pass laws to ban migrants coming from the United States bring unproductive colonies under their control and forever banning slavery in Mexico. Along with the law banning future migrants arriving from the United States, the authorities work to bring the frontier under control by setting up garrisons near the U.S.-Mexican border. In 1830, Mexican forces erect three fortifications along the coast and near the Sabine River that marks the boundary between the two nations. Fort Anahuac is established on the eastern coast of Galveston Bay, Fort Velasco is placed at the mouth of the Brazos River, and Fort Tehran is built south of Nacogdoches on the Natchez River. These posts are set up to enforce Mexican laws and collect customs on trade goods arriving on the Texas coast. However, just as tensions between the Texan colonists and Mexican soldiers seem to die down, a popular general named Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana in Veracruz leads a Federalist coup against the unpopular President Bustamante in early 1832. Seeing the civil war unfold in the heart of the country, Texan militias use this opportunity to rid themselves of the hated local garrisons in East Texas. Known as the Anahuac Disturbances, the colonists first target the garrison at Fort Anahuac, which is under the command of Colonel Juan Davis Bradburn. Bradburn, who was a veteran of the War of 1812 and now an officer in the Mexican Army, manages to anger the local population against him after arresting two local lawyers named Patrick C. Jack and William B. Travis. 
Fearing that these men will be extradited to Matamoros, the militias rise up, elect Francis Frank Johnson as their commander, and surrounded the garrison at Fort Anahuac. Unable to bring the Mexican garrison to the negotiating table, the two sides skirmish with each other until the militia retreats north to Turtle Bayou to await reinforcements. As the Texans wait for the arrival of artillery, they draft the Turtle Bayou resolutions, declaring their support for Santa Ana and the Federalist cause. Meanwhile, another group of Texan militia under Captain John Austin, no relation to Stephen F. Austin, attacks Fort Velasco under Colonel Domingo de Ugarachea, who tries to prevent the passage of a ship carrying a cannon for the comrades in Anahuac. After a sharp firefight, the garrison surrenders and is allowed to sail south to Mexico. As the Battle of Velasco is raging, the ranking officer in the region, Colonel Jose de las Piedras, arrives in Anahuac. Fearing that he is outnumbered by the militias, Piedras bows to the colonists' demands and removes Bradburn from his position. After settling the matters in Anahuac, Piedras heads back to Nacogdoches. Soon after Piedras is gone, the garrison of Fort Anahuac declares their support for the Federalists as well and board ships bound for the Rio Grande. When he returns to Nacogdoches, Piedras wants to prevent another conflict with the locals and orders them to surrender their guns. Instead of complying, the Texian militia rises up and marches against Nacogdoches. When the Texians reach the outskirts of the town, they are attacked by Mexican dragoons. Following a short firefight, the cavalrymen are repulsed, allowing the militiamen to bring the fight into the town. After two days of hard house-to-house -house fighting, the defeated Mexican garrison surrenders and are expelled from Texas. Buoyed by their success, the Texans organize a convention to petition the government in Mexico City to alter the laws passed back in 1830. In October of 1832, 55 delegates representing only the Anglo population gathers in San Felipe de Austin to seek compensation for their support of the Federalist cause during the recent Civil War. Though not fully on board, Stephen F. Austin is elected as President of the Convention. Under Austin's observation, the delegates seek a relaxation of the immigration laws, a three-year exclusion from custom duties, the right to form militias in a separate state. However, before the resolutions could reach the Federal Government, Political Chief Ramon Musquiz rules the convention illegal. To compromise with the residents, Musquiz submits to Congress a similar resolution drafted by the Ayuntamiento of Bejar. Dissatisfied, the Texans call for another convention in April of 1833. For the upcoming convention, 56 delegates are elected, including the Tejano town of San Antonio de Bejar, which refused to participate in the first delegation. At the beginning of April, the convention meets for a second time in San Felipe. The delegates elect William H. Warden president of the convention, who lost his bid to Austin for president the previous year. Warden, unlike Austin, is a lot more hawkish than his predecessor. The convention mirrors much of the first, however, the delegates also agree to pursue independent statehood and draft a state constitution. Once completed, the delegates vote for Austin to deliver the petition to the federal government. After the delegates are finished, Austin departs for the capital. Austin arrives in Mexico City in mid-July, but is unable to meet with the government officials as they adjourn due to a cholera outbreak in the capital. While waiting for Congress to reconvene, Austin is arrested for stirring up support against the government and is imprisoned for the next two years in Mexico City. During his detention, the government does address several of the proposals such as more representation in government, lifting the immigration ban, and allowing for an American-style legal court. However, just as the Texans believe they finally received their past due compensation, Santa Ana, the President of Mexico, and the Darling of the Federalists overturns the Constitution of 1824 and centralizes power. After leading the coup against President Bustamante, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana was elected President of the United Mexican States in 1833. However, he only desires the title, not the responsibilities that are associated with the role. Instead of governing himself, Santa Ana retires to his country estate. However, after some time away from power, 
and seeing a coalition form against his government, Santa Ana takes back the reins of power. Unhappy with the destabilized condition of the federal government, Santa Ana centralizes power and overturns the Constitution of 1824 on January 4, 1835, replacing it with a unitary constitution called Las Siete Leyes. This new constitution effectively ends the first Mexican Republic. In its place, the centralist Mexican Republic is born. As the news spreads throughout the country of the constitution's overturning, Federalist rebellions soon engulf Mexico. To quell the revolts, Santa Ana marches out against the rebels and smashes a few Federalist armies in Oaxaca and Zacatecas. To punish the rebels, Santa Ana allows his troops time to plunder the states. Appalled by the brutality of the Centralists, more Federalists rose up in defiance. As another civil war is being raged in the heart of the country, Texans are unsure of who they support. While the Texans are considering their options, another disturbance takes hold in Anahuac. In June of 1835, the new garrison commander of Fort Anahuac, Captain Antonio Tenario, arrests a merchant named Andrew Briscoe for attempting to trick his men. As news of the arrest reaches San Felipe, political chief Peter Miller authorizes William B. Travis to form a militia company to rescue Briscoe and his partner. Instead of marching overland to Anahuac, Travis commandeers a ship in Harrisburg, mounts a gun on its bow, and sails for the fort. As Travis nears Fort Anahuac, he fires on the fort. Unnerved by the audacity of the Texians, Captain Tenorio surrenders his command. With the surrender of Tenorio, Briscoe and his partner are freed and the surrender troops are expelled from Texas. In response to the assault on Fort Anahuac, Colonel Ugarachea, the new military commander of Texas, orders a warrant for Travis's arrest and calls for reinforcements. On August 9, 1835, upon hearing the news of the attack on Fort Anahuac and the warrant for Travis's arrest, the citizens of Brazoria call for another convention to coordinate the response to the rising tensions in the state. Militia summons are sent out and a new round of delegates are elected to convene in San Felipe. Stephen F. Austin, once a firm support of the Mexican government, now put his full support behind this new convention. However, before the convention could meet in San Felipe on October 8th, news of a clash between Mexican troops and Texian militia arrived from a small town east of Bejar called Gonzales. Gonzales, a small town that sits on the open prairie 63 miles east of Bejar, was once a town that supported the Mexican government, but now is a hotbed for rebels after Mexican soldier bludgeoned Jesse McCoy with little justification on September 10, 1835. This act of military brutality shocked the populace and convinced them that soon it would be their turn to suffer the same sensuous wrath that was unleashed upon the helpless people of Zacatecas. Their fears are further confirmed when Colonel Udachea recalls the six-pound cannon that the town was given for defense. Back in 1826, Gonzales was burned to the ground by raiding Comanches. It was soon rebuilt, but the Mexican garrison Bejar was unable to spare the troops to defend the town. Instead, they loaned a small six-pound cannon to the people with the condition that it would be returned when asked for. Now with the growing tension between the settlers and the Mexican troops and the recent being in McCoy, the citizens of Gonzales have no intention to return the cannon. The soldiers who are sent to reclaim the cannon are escorted out of the town. When word got back that the citizens of Gonzales refused his order, Ugridechea, infuriated by this defiance, sends a detachment of dragoons commanded by Lieutenant Francisco Castaneda to reclaim the cannon. The troopers left Bejar in late September and headed east towards the rebellious town. Meanwhile, in Gonzales, the citizens prepare themselves for the eventual return of the Mexicans. They remove all the boats from the western side of the Guadalupe and spread their pickets out along the riverbank to hamper any crossing. On September 29th, Castaneda and his force of 100 dragoons arrive opposite the town. Standing in their way is a militia force of 18 men led by Captain Albert Martin. As Castaneda is instructed to peacefully reclaim the cannon, he does not force his way across the Guadalupe and thus start communicating with Martin about the surrender of the gun. Martin informs Castaneda that Alcade Andrew Ponton is out of town and until he returns, the force has to weigh on the western side of the river. Unbeknownst to the troopers, 
The Texans are determined not to surrender the cannon and buried the gun to prevent its capture. Realizing that a small force of 18 men would stand no chance against the Mexican force across the river, Martin sends out calls for help while stalling Castaneda as long as possible. Castaneda, willing to follow protocol, pulls his men back to DeWitt's Hill, the highest point in the area to wait developments. As word goes around declaring the arrival of the Mexican force in front of Gonzalez, militia companies from the surrounding area heed the call and march toward the town. By the end of the day, over 80 men from Fayette and Columbus join the ranks of the Gonzalez militia. Even though Martin is the nominal commander on the scene, other militiamen refuse to serve under him. Keeping to American militia tradition, they vote for their new officers. John H. Moore of Fayette is elected the leader of the entire Texian force. The next day, Castaneda again reiterates his request for the cannon, but to no avail. He reports to his superior Behar that he suspects the Texans are stalling to receive more reinforcements. Back in Behar, Ugo de Chea recruits Dr. Lancelot Smither, a Gonzalez doctor, to intercede and convince the town to hand over the cannon. Smither, along with an escort, leaves the town and arrives in Gonzales on October 1st. The doctor meets with militia captain Matthew Caldwell. Smither tries to convince him, but he is rebuffed and told to remain in the Mexican camp until the next morning while relaying a message to Castaneda that his men will not be molested. However, contrary to what Caldwell said, the Texans are preparing for a fight. Moore, in command of the growing Texan force in Gonzales, holds a council of war that night and deems it necessary to attack if Castaneda refuses. Once all the officers agree, the Texans prepare themselves to advance. An artillery detachment digs up the cannon and the men ready their weapons for combat. Before advancing on the foe, local Methodist minister W.P. Smith preaches a fiery sermon with references to the American Revolution in the War of 1812, two events that are all too well relevant in the minds of the Texians. During the evening of October 1st, while the Texans are assembling for battle, a Cushata Indian informed Castaneda that the militia had around 140 men and are expecting more in the morning. Realizing that he is now outnumbered, Castaneda pulls his dragoons from DeWitt's Hill and moves seven miles west to a place where he could easily ford the river. Meanwhile, back in Gonzales, the Texans move out at nightfall and head west toward the Mexican encampment. Their force consists of 130 infantry and 50 cavalry. At 7 p.m., the Texans cross the Guadalupe and silently advance toward the Mexican camp. As they are nearing the camp, a thick fog falls over the Texans around midnight, slowing their advance considerably. Three hours later, the Texans near the camp, but right before they attack, a barking dog and a subsequent discharge of a Mexican carbine breaks the silence. The Battle of Gonzales is on. With the element of surprise lost, the two sides trade volleys with each other in the pitch black darkness. During the exchange, a horse rears and throws his rider to the ground, breaking his nose, becoming the first casualty of the revolution. With the surprise gone, Colonel Moore pulls his men back to the tree line along the riverbank to wait for the morning sun to clear the fog that has settled over the area. Castaneda could not determine the size of the force attacking him. He is incensed at the fact that the Texans broke their word and decides to move his men to a slight ridge 300 yards in the rear to prepare for battle. As light breaks the darkness on October 2nd, the Texans realize they are on the farm of Ezekiel Williams. Around 6 a.m., the Texans advance cautiously towards the Mexican position on the ridge and start sniping at the Dragoons. Annoyed, Castaneda orders Lt. Perez and 40 Dragoons to charge the skirmishers. As the cavalry advances, the Texans retreat to the protection of the tree line. Unable to penetrate this formidable position, Perez pulls his detachment back to the ridge. After repulsing the cavalry charge, the Texans hear more hooves incoming. This time, however, the rider is Dr. Smither. Dr. Smither was initially arrested for unintentionally deceiving the Mexican commander, but was released when Castaneda needed a messenger to parlay with the Texians. As Smither and Moore discuss the situation, Moore does not like how friendly Smither is towards the Mexicans and arrests him on the spot. Moore decides to speak with Castaneda himself and the commanders meet in between the two forces. Castaneda demands on why Moore attacked his force. Moore responds by saying that Castaneda is following the orders of the centralist usurper Santa Ana. 
Moore implores the lieutenant to switch sides and join the Federalists. Shocked at the thought of mutiny, Castaneda leaves the meeting. As the two commanders return to their respective sides, Moore orders the cannon to open up on the Mexicans. After the initial shot, the Texans unfurl a white banner with an image of a cannon along with a challenge that reads, Come and Take It, painted on the flag. Then, Moore orders the advance. With a spirited yell, the Texian riflemen step forward and advance but are met by little resistance as Castaneda decides to withdraw his force from the field. As the Mexicans retreat, the Battle of Gonzales comes to an end. Though termed as a battle, it is merely a skirmish as only two Mexicans are killed and a single Texian wounded in the fight. Though small in scale, the Battle of Gonzales is a watershed moment for the Texians and the impact of the fight is immeasurable. Once the word spread that the Gonzales militia stood their ground and attacked government troops, there was no turning back. The Texians are ready to take the fight to the Centralists and rid their state of what they see as a hostile takeover by Santa Ana and his forces. However, just as the news spread of the victory at Gonzales, the Texans' fear of a centralist takeover comes to fruition. General Martin Perfecta de Cos, Santa Ana's brother-in-law, lands at Capano Bay with 500 soldiers, with the task to strip the colonists of their arms and expel all troublemakers. 